Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our Talks with Walt as we are calling our readings now through all of the poems of Leaves of Grass and we are now turning to Song of Myself, passage number 33. Now, look, let's just say this out loud. If you have made it to this point in conversations with me, at LearnStrong.net, down that left-hand side, Talks with Walt. And you did all of the 24 poems of inscriptions, and you did all of the 19 sections of Palmanach, and you've done already the 32 previous sections of, uh, of Song of Myself. Then you are ready now to wade into the 160 lines of this section. No question the longest section of... Uh, of Song of Myself, and a very demanding bit of lines as well, just simply because of what Whitman's going to try to pull off here. But, hey guys, this is why we did all that precedent reading. And in some ways, we're reminded of what we've said about Dante in our studies at LearnStrong.net, that at the same time, Dante is the most specific of poets and the most universalist of poets. We're going to see this as well, of very much true of, of, of Whitman. Now, hey, reminding you that we said that um, here we're messing around with sections 26 through 38 as the poet's microscopic vision moving from the ordinary to the sublime and the mystical. We're definitely going to see that in this, in this example. This uh, will be the great catalog section. Much like passage 15, as we've already spoken of from Song of Myself, uh, on steroids, okay? And, and again, it's just an amazing accomplishment in so many ways. Um, now, we've said already that passage 31 to 33, we're finishing now, is this catalog of infinite worlds and small things, and we're definitely going to see that one as well here. Now, I think it's so important, as I've said to you, that when you pick up Song of Myself to read it, I think passage 4 and those lines from passage 4 are really crucial, and so that's why we keep coming back to it. What are those lines? Both in and out of the game, and watching and wondering at it, I witness and wait. This will be a section of witnessing. It's literally like he's going up in a hot air balloon. That's his word picture, in fact. And he's looking at everything, and he's trying to somehow capture everything. Of course, he wants to put everything he can in this poem, and much like Dante will try to do in the Divine Comedy. And he, he pulls it off in majestic ways. I mean, we're going to be blown away by this. Now, let me just say this out loud. Early readers to Leaves of Grass and Song of Myself are often really frustrated by passage 33 because it just seems to go on and on and on forever. I'm going to try to give you a schemata where we'll divide this thing up into like 18 sections so that way we will be able to address them in their sections and I hope then that you'll be able to kind of you know get some sense of it. Now, put this in your notes. We talk about our big five. What does this text say about epistemology, what you can know? Again, the fallibilist position will be his position. I think I'm right, but I could be wrong. Ontological understandings is our second of the big five. Who are you and who am I? Of course, we have questions about psychology, the study of the individual mind, sociology, the study of the group. And then finally, our last of our big five is the question of theodicy. Right. That is to say, why must there be pain and suffering in this world? And again, as we've said in earlier lectures, Whitman will make the argument that when bad things happen, we have to learn to ask, not why did this happen to me, but rather, why did this happen for me? And we're going to see this game get played out here now in Whitman's theodicy and the, and, and the uh, attribution that there is in fact pain and suffering in the world. He will notice in this poem, start with great joy and end with great sorrow, great agony. We're going we're gonna to pay attention to the way that that happens, okay? Now, I'm just going to uh, let Norton's, uh, our annotated version here, help us for a moment. Uh, and this is the way that it's spoken of, section of section 33. Walt Whitman's so-called cataloging, brilliantly illustrated in these, in these lines, especially 717 to 797, is in many later passages of, uh, uh, as in many later passages of Leaves of Grass, used to be occasionally cited as evidence of his quote-unquote barbarism or naivete as an artist. In other words, at the time, many people said 
This cannot be this grocery list of this and this and this. This cannot be poetry. Now this aspect of his technique is generally recognized for what it is, the powerful employment of a great imagination which delights to celebrate God in every object, quote-unquote, with loving exact art. And then um, there's some recommended even articles that will pay particular attention to this. Now the opening set of lines, and we'll again take these by sections, are to play around now with space and time. It is fascinating to look at the 1855 uh, version. By the way, most of what he wrote in 1855 remains for our deathbed edition. But the first lines are fascinatingly different. The 1855 version ran this way. Swift wind, exclamation point. Space, exclamation point. My soul, exclamation point. Now I see it is true what I guessed at. And by the way, the word guest was completely spelled out as opposed to the alighted verb as we see it now in the deathbed edition. But this is the editing version. And again, we're, we're trying to stay away from too much judgment here of what, you know, which one is the better. I'll, I'll, I'll leave that one to you guys to figure out, okay? Instead, it starts out this way. Space and time. We do get an exclamation point. Now I see, and of course that whole thing of sight is so central, right? Now I see, although in the 55 version it was now I know, it is true what I guessed at, what I guessed when I loafed on the grass, what I guessed while I lay alone in my bed, and again as I walked the beach under the paling stars of the morning. Now this is an interesting opening set of lines because notice we're going to begin with this very immediacy. Now I see. It is true. And again, we're to our, of course, epistemological, is it absolutism? Is it fallibilism? Well, we're going to call it fallibilism because notice the next, line, next set of words. What I guessed at, what I guessed when I loafed on the grass. And this, of course, will take us back to the opening lines of Song of Myself. That is to say, passage one. Or, if we're messing around with the deathbed edition, all the way back to the very opening lines at the epigraph. It's almost as if... Whitman is aware that by passage 33, he's going to try to assume everything that's come before. It's an amazing, amazing thing that he's even going to try something like this. Obviously, he'll have Dante and Milton and Shakespeare all in his mind as he's trying to do something that well, this just hadn't been done before in poetry, with possibly the exception of the three I just listed, right? When I guess that when I loafed on the grass, of course, we're familiar with that, loafing on the grass and observing a spear of summer grass. What I guessed while I lay alone in my bed, this kind of solitary understanding. And again, as I walk the beach, and we think of starting from Pomenoc, under the paling stars of the morning. In other words, we're going to see Whitman play, playing games all the time with sailing, with walking, here with guessing. And then he's going to use his hot air balloon journey motif. My ties and ballasts leave me. Um, he, in the 55 version, said, I travel, I sail. My elbows rest in sea gaps. I skirt Sierras. My palms cover continents. I am afoot with my vision. Now, of course, this is the great, great inclusive thinker, right? This is the omnis, omnis of starting from Pomenach, passage 7. I, I told you when we did that, we would come back to talk about why omnis is such an important word here. Notice as well how he says, my elbows rest in sea gaps. It's this majestic imagery, right, of Poseidon himself with the huge elbows in the trough of the wave, of the waves, right, of the ocean. I skirt Sierras, my palms cover continents. This will sound very much like Keats's Bright Star, right? Many argue with the last poem he ever wrote. I've given full lecture on that notion. I am afoot, and of course this will be the opening lines of, of Song of the Open Roads, afoot and lighthearted I take to the open road, healthy free the world before me, and then notice with my vision. And I, I've been saying to you guys that I think it's really significant that we pay attention to the Tiresias figure. You could say the Merlin figure as well, but for, for sure the Tiresias figure, that notion of the vision. In other words, Whitman's trying to share this vision that he sees with you, the reader. And now we're to the second, as, I, as I'm arbitrarily making these up. Guys, you can play this game any way you want to. I mean, think about this. You can create all kinds of taxonomies 
as you want from passage 33. Uh, some have done it male, female, some have done it human versus non-human, some have done it city versus rural, some have done it occupationally, I mean, it, however you want to do it, okay? And I've just kind of divided these up. But so what, there, there does seem to be a certain kind of sequencing as we move through this. By the city's quadrangled houses, in log huts, camping with lumbermen. Now notice we're dealing, obviously, with domiciles. Among the ruts of the turnpike, interestingly, we're going to hear more about this in the Song of the Open Road, along the dry gulch and rivulet bed, weeding my onion patch, or hoeing rows of carrots and parsnips, crossing savannas, trailing in forests. By the way, notice all these participles instead of verbs. Did you see this, right? So we're, we're, we're hearing lots and lots of this, right? Trailing, hauling, prospecting, gold digging, girdling the trees of a new purchase. It's, it, notice his verbs, his, par, his participles are fun here. Scorched, ankle deep by the hot sun, hauling my boat down the shallow river. Well, notice all of these different kind of images have to do with engaging with nature and being out in nature. Of course, you've got all kinds of growing kinds of, uh, of imagery here. Carrots and parsnips. I mean, it's a fun thing to just read, as I said when I did passage 32 and uh, 31 and 32. It's a fun thing to play around with the question of how many different animals get mentioned in this Leaves of Grass book, and as well, it's a fun question to ask, how many different kinds of plant life are going to be mentioned? And we're going to get all kinds of examples even just here. Uh, and then to the third section, as I am arbitrarily kind of using it, because now we're going to begin with the word where. Now this is the big, you know how you play, kids play that game of Where's Waldo? Well, in many ways, without realizing it, that game is actually Whitman's game. And we are going to get 49 times the word where is going to get repeated now. And, and this does drive some, some readers nuts. But I want to point out how this anaphoria, of course, as we've talked about it so regularly, now comes to its ultimate fruition here. As I said, passage 15 on steroids, right? Um, we're going to get this game that gets played, right, over and over again. Um, it actually comes out to 50 of these if you will count wherever the one time it gets used. And you begin to wonder if Whitman's on to something intentional here, right? Where the panther walks, again, we got all these different kinds of animals. And panther is a fairly exotic animal, though, for North America, yes? So it's fascinating the way he'll play this game. It's a very international um, uh, collection of poems and leaves of grass, as we pointed out. We'll point this out in its fruition moment in Passage to India, later, a poem later. Where the panther walks to and fro on a limb overhead, the eye, the poetic eye is amazing. Where the buck turns furiously at the hunter, notice your adverb there, furiously. Where the rattlesnake suns his flabby length on a rock, where the otter is feeding on fish. Obviously, we got all kinds of animal kinds of uh, stuff going in here. Where the alligator in his tough pimples sleeps by the bayou. Now, I love to point this out to readers of Leaves of Grass. Wait a minute. Tough pimples? There's a great, great description of what the alligator's fleshy outside looks like, but yet... Heard this word pimples before? I have. And it is, of course, passage number 15, a song of myself. Only then he wasn't talking about an alligator, he was talking about the neck of a prostitute who was being ridiculed by men as she walks down the street. It's, it's these echoes that make Lisa Grass so remarkable to me. Where the black bear's uh, searching for roots uh, uh, or honey. We, of course, know all about roots because we've been reading Leaves of Grass, right? Where the beaver pats the mud with his paddle-shaped tail. In the 55 version, it was just paddle tail. Um, it is then going to be a, a new section with the word over. And we're going we're gonna to see this one now several times. Over, over, over. I mean, we've got, we've got a number of, of these as well that we'll be playing around with, which is kind of interesting the way he'll play this game, all right? So let's, let's take a look at it. Over the growing tree, and you can start numbering all these. And, I, and, and it makes sense to do this if you're going to play around it to be at all. Over the growing sugar, over the yellow, uh, yellow flowered cotton plant. Obviously, now we're, we're moving to certain kinds of imagery of, of growth and, and flowering and, and, and that kind of thing. The rice, 
in its uh, low moist field, it is fascinating to ask how many different kinds of grain, rice, grass are going to end up in leaves of grass. Over the sharp be uh, peaked farmhouse with its scalloped scum and slender shoots from the gutters, in other words, that sediment that would sit on the top of the roof where grass actually would grow, weeds, right? Over the western uh, uh, persimmon, over the long leaf corn, over the delicate uh, blue flower flax over the white and brown buckwheat, and, and this word over gives you the sense of, again, a, a, a hot air balloon that's kind of traveling over it. A hummer and buzzer there with the rest over the dusky green of the rye as it ripples and shades in the breeze. All of these, of course, are imagery of things that grow. Leaves of grass comes to mind. Then to the fifth section is I'm arbitrarily making it, because notice there seems to be kind of a shift in a focus. Scaling mountains. Pulling myself cautiously up, holding on by low scratched uh, limbs for the rock climbers in the house. You'll love these lines. Walking the path worn in the grass and beat through the leaves of the brush. Now, yes, of course Whitman knows what he's doing if he's going to call his poem Collection of Poems, Leaves of Grass. And here in one line he'll use the word leaves and he'll use the word grass. But he'll keep them separated and he uses the word path and worn. And of course, all of this is going to be, is going to be just, it's a genius little section, right? Walking, and hear the rhythm of this, right? Walking the path worn in the grass and beat through the leaves of the brush. It's beautiful. Now to the sixth section, as I'll see it, we're back to more animals. Where the quail is whistling betwixt the woods and the wheat lot, where the bat flies in the seventh month eve. By the way, he called it July in 55, and then he called it seventh month. He, we will have seen this earlier as well in Lisa Grass. Where the great gold bug drops through the dark. And again, this all the different bugs and, you know, dung beetles. and It's just an amazing thing. Now, we do have a, 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 an absent line from the 55 that runs where the uh, um, flails keep uh, time uh, on the barn floor. It's an interesting question. Why this one was edited out? Where the brook puts out of the roots, again, we're back to roots, of the old tree and flows to the meadow, where cattle stand and shake away flies with the tremulous shuddering of their hides. Notice all those S sounds. And that's a great I as well, right? The, the rippling of, their, of the cows um, to try and keep, keep the flies away. Where the cheesecloth hangs in the kitchen, where Andrians uh, straddle the hearth slab, where cobwebs fall in festoons from the rafters. Obviously, we have all kinds of domestic kinds of imagery here. Where trip hammers crash, where the press is whirring its slenders, where the human heart beats with terrible throes under its, under its ribs, out of its ribs, the 1855 version. We're going to get to more of this at the end of this poem. Uh, where the pear-shaped balloon, and here it is finally, is floating aloft, floating in it myself and looking composedly down. Right. So in other words, we've got this great, great picture. Um, you know, we think, of course, of the, of the great magician David Blaine holding on to all of his balloons and up he goes. Or, of course, the Disney film up itself, right? Um, where the life car is drawn on the slip noose, this will be, of course, that mechanism that allows for pa uh, uh, stranded people to be able to get away, right, and to be safe. Where the heart hatches pale green eggs in the dented sand. His adjectives are wonderful, like dented sand. Where the she whale swims with her calf and never forsakes it. By the way, in the 55 version, it was calves and it was them. Why he went to the singular? Because notice, he's always, he's always messing around with the definite article, right? Um, that is to say, it's the mockingbird, not a mockingbird, right? It's this homely woman, as we'll see it, at all focusing on one, even though it's, of course, the universal. So he's playing this game, right? Where the she whale swims with her calf and never forsakes it, where the steamship trails hind ways its long pennant of smoke, where the fin of the shark cuts like a black chip out of the water. By the way, it was the grounded shark, interestingly, in 55. Where the half-burned brig is riding on unknown currents, where shells grow to her slimy deck, where the dead are corrupting below. It's an interesting image, right, of people who have died on the ship and now are under in, under the deck of the ship. And, you know, they're, they're, they're corrupting, right? Their bodies are corrupting. Where the dense starred flag is born at the head of the regiments. We're going to hear more about this when we get to the drum trap section. And then I see, a, I see another natural break here for Passage 7, as I'm calling it. Approaching Manhattan up the long-stretched island. Obviously, we think of Pomona. Um, under Niagara, the cataract falling like a veil over my countenance, obviously the falls of Niagara were a, a huge impression on Whitman. Um, upon a doorstep, upon the horse block of hardwood outside, upon the 
and again, repetitions of a pond. The race course or enjoying picnics or jigs. By the way, picnics was spelled in the 55 version, P-I-C dash N-I-C-S. Interesting. Or a good game of baseball. Now think about this. I mean, for those of us that love America's game, think about it, right? The first actual game of baseball, many historians argue, 19th of June, 1846. Remember, we're in 1855 here, right? Uh, for Leaves of Grass. Hoboken, uh, Hob Hoboken New Jersey, um, where the New York Nines defeated the Knickerbockers 23 to 1 in four innings, right? And here, the mention of baseball. At heat festivals with black guard jives, ironical license, bull dances, drinking, laughter. By the way, this bull dance is a slang, right, for buffalo dance of, the, of, of, of natives, native peoples. At the cedar mill, tasting the sweets of the brown mash, it was called squash in 55, sucking the juice through a straw, it's, it's, it's so much of the eye that he has. At apple peelings, we think maybe this is the first use of this in print, apple peelings, wanting kisses for all the red fruit I find at musters, uh, that is to say, this is kind of a rare uh, use of a localism, kind of like a musters group of people. Beach parties, friendly bees, we're going to hear about bees a number of times in Leaves of Grass, and every time we think about our Virgil, don't we? Huskings, house raisings, of course, Quakers especially were known for house raisings where you got together to, to build the house. And then an eighth section begins now for me with where the mockingbird sounds, his delicious gurgles, cackles, screams, weeps. Um, we're going to meet this mockingbird. We've met him already. We're going to meet him again out of the cradle, endlessly rocking and elsewhere. Where the hayrick stands in the barnyard, where we've seen barnyards and hay before, where the dry stalks are scattered, where the brood cow waits in the hovel, where the bull advances to his masculine work. Now we're going to get some sexuality about animals. Where the stud to the mare, where the cock is treading the hen, where the heifers browse, where geese snip their food with short jerks. It's a great eye, right? Where sundown shadows lengthen over the limitless and lonesome prairie, of course, in 1855, as he's writing is there's that imagery of what's way out there in present-day Kansas, Nebraska, right? Where herds of buffalo make a crawling spread of the square miles far and near, of course, he